own Linda Hare has been printing the catechism that we use with our children here in the Haitian Creole. How many have we got so far, Linda? About 500 catechisms. What a great ministry. We take books for granted here. They don't have them there. And if they did, they'd just as easily use them for firewood to cook with. Amen. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 John chapter 4. We began this study last week. We're not very far into it, and I've already changed the overarching title of it. As I was studying this week after the bulletins had been printed, it gripped me. I came across a term. I may have even used the term last Sunday by Wayne Mack, Dr. Wayne Mack, who, who pastors, who taught it. The John MacArthur Seminary, he made the, ter the term one another into a participle, one anothering, one anothering. I like that, the idea of activity, not an idea, not even a reference to someone else, but an activity. So we've changed the title, and if folks in the media booth can get on our site online and change that for me, I'd appreciate it. One anothering, living, not life living in a gospel community. So it's, it's beyond idea. It's action. And today, we began this last week, we passed out uh, half sheets for you to put in the back of your Bible. We'll get some more of those printed uh, for you uh, very soon. Uh, we're looking at the love of God as the motivation to love one another. Last week, we looked at John 13, 31 to 35, which we read uh, in unison as our reading today, and we looked at how, uh, how Jesus commands us to love one another. It's, it's not an option. Josh said something a while ago that was very profound. I thought when, when God shows his love to us and, and invites us to the cross, he's not inviting us to a bed and breakfast. When he invites us to the cross, guess what he says? Here's your cross. You've come to my cross. You've knelt at my cross. Here's your cross. Now take up your cross. Follow me to the end. We're looking today at 1 John 4, verses 7 to 12. If you found that in your Bibles, uh, stand with me, if you would. And if you don't have a Bible, we're going to put the text on the screen because I'm very concerned that you see as well as hear the Word of God. Follow along as I read. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. What have we read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And my prayer is that as we not begin, because you do show love to one another. We, this report we just heard is the fruit of loving one another. But as we intensify that, as we become more intentional about it, as we become more biblically focused so that we feed upon the Word and the Word gets into us, our minds and our hearts, and then comes out of us, that we will experience increasingly the love of God and show that love to others in serving one another, helping one another, provoking one another, bearing with one another, and all that list of one another's that we gave you last week. Thank you. Please be seated. If you don't have a devotional that you read, 
I want to commend one to you. Uh, Paul David Tripp's devotional, I read from it last week, New Morning Mercies is one of the most grace-filled devotional, daily devotional readings you can find. And I, and I came across another one of his this week that I've just got to read to you because it's so fitting for what we're studying here. Listen to this. His assertion is one of the most basic sins in relationships is inattention. We make greater commitments to our gardens than to the people we say we love. Then he says this. It really is true that the number one reason that relationships of all kinds go bad is neglect. Here's the structure of every relationship this side of eternity. It is a flawed person in a relationship to a flawed person in a fallen world, but with a faithful God. You get that picture? One flawed person in relation to another flawed person in a fallen world, but with a faithful God. Since it's a flawed person in relationship to a flawed person, if you're in a relationship, you simply cannot let that relationship coast and expect that it will be okay. It's like planting a garden. You clear the land, you break up the soil, and you plant, water, and nurture your flowers. But at that point, you do not have the liberty of walking away. Your work has not ended. In fact, it has just begun because you have planted your flowers in impure soil and in a less than perfect environment. Weeds will immediately begin to grow. And if you don't attend to them, they will soon dominate the turf and choke the vitality out of your beautiful flowers. I would say, parenthetically, that weeds are the, are the fastest growing things in our little garden of flowers out front. You pull up a flower, it doesn't come back. You pull up a weed, guess what? Here it comes again. He's exactly right. So it is with relationships. Once a relationship is planted, weeds quickly sprout. Weeds of conflict, control, bitterness, unforgiveness, anger, selfishness, pride, greed, jealousy, impatience, unkindness, and self-righteousness grow and choke the life out of the relationship. Daily attention is needed because every person in a relationship brings something dangerous and destructive into that relationship, something that is antisocial at its core. The Bible names this thing sin. As long as sin lives in us, it has the power to wreak havoc on our relationships, so we cannot neglect the daily nurture that they need. A good relationship is a good relationship because the people in the relationship never quit working on the relationship. Does this sound dark to you? Does it make you want to run away from relationships? Well, you need not be afraid because of, if you're God's child, you bring something else into your relationships that should give you hope. Peter reminds married couples in 1 Peter 3, 7 that they are joint heirs of the grace of life. There is hope for your relationships. There are resources for the struggle because you have inherited big, expansive, powerful, rescuing, and transforming grace. This grace is so huge and powerful that there is no way to wrap human words around it. This grace motivates and empowers the hard work that every relationship requires. In times of trouble, you move toward the other person, knowing the inheritance that you have been given for such a time as this, day after day, knowing the grace you have been given, you rid your relationships of the weeds of selfishness and sin so that flowers of peace and love may grow. And in the end, you don't celebrate how good you are at relationships. No, you celebrate the giver of that grace. This grace daily rescues you from your bondage to you and gives you the resources to be a person who truly loves others. one anothering. That's what Jesus calls us to do. I want us to see in this text today different uh, headings. Because God is love, love is sourced in God, verses 7 and 8. Second, Jesus Christ is the ultimate manifestation of God's love. <clears throat> we sang some great songs about that. Third, God's love will motivate us to love one another. Let's Let's look at this. This word, by the way, I don't think I defined it last week. This word, one another, 
uh, is one word in the Greek. It's, in fact, it's called a reciprocal pronoun. If you look at that, there's the Greek of that. I don't expect you to know that, but there's the English transliteration, alelon, alelon, is one another. And First John <clears throat> expresses, uh, this expresses mutuality on the part of those addressed in First John. Mutuality. In other words, you cannot embrace the call to the one anothering without another being involved. I saw a poem years ago, a little brief poem. It said, so much in love with us are we that you could love you and I could love me. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about the fellow who says, my wife and I have so much in common because she loves me almost as much as I love me. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about one another, others. It requires relationships. And so this reciprocal pronoun, and we'll be looking at, of course, 1 John uh, 1, 7. We'll be coming to that later on. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In chapter 3, verse 11, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Chapter 3, verse 23, and this is the commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Then in chapter 4, verse 7, 11, and 12, that's what we're looking at today. First of all, because God is love, love is sourced in God. Look at verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another. That's not a command there. It's an, it's an exhortation. It's a call. Let us love one another, for love is from God. He's using the word agape here. We, I won't go through the excursus again on, on phileo love and eros love and agape love. We've done that several times. If you have questions about that, you feel free to talk to me about it. Agape love. Agape love says, I love you without conditions. I don't love you if, or I don't love you because, or I don't love you as long as. I love you because that's the kind of love we were shown by God. And this is the love he's talking about. For love is from God. And whoever, I'm going to give you the force of the verb, say, whoever is loving, in other words, it's a present active. It's, it's a matter of habit. It's a course of your life. It's just, it's the way you operate. No, we don't do it perfectly. Sometimes we struggle. Sometimes it's hard to love somebody. But, but the, the mentality, the attitude, the posture is, Whoever is loving, watch this, has been born of God. It's one of the evidences that you've been born again. A lot of people think they're Christians, but they're mean as snakes. No. Whoever is loving, it's because, it's, it's one of the fruit of being born again. Whoever is loving has been born of God and knows, has a relationship, is knowing God. That's not knowing about God. I've had people tell me through the year, well, I believe in God and all that stuff. Uh, 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 uh. What stuff? Is knowing God. It's, it's a loving heart, which necessarily means a one anothering commitment, is evidence you've been born again and that you have a, a relationship with God. Now, John, if you know anything about 1 John, he is tough as nails. He doesn't pull any punches. So the very next verse, and anyone who does not love does not know God. You get that? Whoever does not love, and he's talking about one another here in the context. He's, you're going to see that clearly. He's not talking about a person in love with himself, not talking about a person in love with things, in love with life. He's talking about a person who loves others, does not know God. And then here's the, here's the force of the verse here. Because God is love. And because God's very nature and essence is love. We could say that there are two core uh, characteristics out of which all the characteristics of God, all the character traits of God flow. His holiness and his essence as love. In fact, I'm going to tell you, a lot of people 
falling in love, falling out of love today and things like that. And, and, uh, and it really it has more to do with lust than it does love. Because you see, if you don't have a knowing, saving relationship with God, then, then your love for others will be selfish necessarily. But when you know God, when you've been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, then the love of God, which has been planted in you, Peter says we've been made partakers of the divine nature when we're saved. It doesn't mean what some of these fellows talk about, about how and I am God. I say, no, 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 no. But partakers of the divine nature, that, that this essence of God, which is agape love, is implanted in us by the Spirit in the new birth and begins to be cultivated. And as we read from Paul David Tripp, if you neglect that garden, weeds will grow in the relationship. But if you cultivate that garden, love grows in the relationship. So you have this first assertion. Because God is himself love, love is sourced in God. If you want to love others, you must encounter and experience the saving love and mercy of God in Jesus Christ. You must repent of your sin, commit your life to Jesus Christ. Paul says, when Christ, who is our life, appears. He's not a part of our life. He's not a decoration. He's not an appendage. He is our life. Just like God is love, Christ becomes the life and the lifeblood of the believer. Second thing I want you to see is that Jesus Christ is the ultimate manifestation of God's love. Look at verses 9 and 10. John says, In this the love of God was made manifest among us. You say, you want to know what love looks like? Look at Jesus Christ. That God sent his only son into the world so that, there's a purpose there, we might live through him. See, we were all, Paul says in Ephesians 2, that we're all dead in trespasses and sins. We come into this world not in neutral, we come into this world dead in trespasses and sins. And when we're brought to life by the Holy Spirit in the new birth, we're enabled to repent of our sins and commit our lives to Jesus Christ so that we might live through him. Jesus said in John 10, the thief, that is the devil, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Look what he does to relationships. Jesus says, but I have come that you might have life. And have it abundantly. Have a full, rich life. Not a life full of riches necessarily, but a rich, meaningful, purposeful life. Living, discovering your purpose that God made you to glorify Him and to enjoy Him forever. And then spend eternity delighting in Him. That we might live through Him. Verse 10, in this is love. He's really, he's really burrowing down here. Not that we love God. The idea there is not that we love God first. We did not love God. Paul says in Romans 8, we were, we were enmity with God. Our minds were set against God. Our affections were set against God. The choices we made were anti-God before we were saved. And you know people today, if you're trying to figure them out, take a look. If they're not in love with God through Jesus Christ, it explains the hostility. It explains the misplaced affections. It explains the choosing mechanism and apparatus. Because all that is changed when we're born again. And our minds, which were darkened, the Scripture says, now are enlightened. We see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We long to be like Him. Our hearts, which were set against him and were set on the things of the flesh, now our hearts are set on him. And our choosers follow. The will always follows the mind and the heart. I don't stand here and tell you, now, you know, I need to take care of myself. And then all of a sudden, my hand uncontrollably slapped me in the face. No, those things flow out of the chooser, out of the will, all right? And so he says that, that Jesus is the ultimate manifestation. The more we study the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, the more we become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, the more we take on the, the properties of love, and the more one anothering will become second nature to us. 
Look, as long as we're on this earth, we're going to fight selfishness. We're going to fight selfishness. But the operative word there is fight. We're not going to give in to it. We're not going to nurture it and coddle it. We're not going to take a cobra into our bosom as our pet. We're going to fight it. So you look at Jesus Christ, the ultimate manifestation of God's love. The third thing I want you to see is that God's love will motivate us to love one another. Now, notice what it says in verses 11 and 12. Beloved, and the word beloved, by the way, we've told you this before, it's a, it, you think of the agape word for love. This is agape toss. Loved ones. You who are loved. That's what he's saying. If you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, you're beloved in his sight. You're loved by him. So, beloved, if God so loved us, and he's not posing that as a, as a question, you think, well, am I, did God really love No. It's a, it's, a, it's a class in the Greek since God so loved us, we also ought, there's an oughtness to it. Just as Jesus commands in John 13, 31 to 35, a new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. We ought to love one another. Now don't don't shrink back at the idea of obligation. I had a fellow say to me years ago, well, I, I just don't like those words like ought and command. I, I think that I, it ought to be something I want to do. And here's my, my response is, you know something, when you're saved by grace through faith, your want to is fixed. It's changed. But you still live in a fallen world, luring you going, hey, you, you don't need to go do that. That's, gosh, that's way above and beyond. Our brothers and sisters, the Burgesses, need help. They've had renters in their home for 12 years who didn't take care of it. It was supposed to be a smoke-free home. Guess what the renters did? They ignored that. It, it's a smoke-filled home now. They need help. I could use the excuse, look, look you look up the definition of unhandy in the dictionary, and, and, and my picture would be, my, I'd be kind of going, that's no excuse. We ought to love one another. I'm going to give you a list. You can go and say, you know, I think I can do that. And then we're going to undertake this. We're going to put one anothering in gospel gear. We ought to love one another. Then he says in verse 12, no one has ever seen God. Now, what's, he, what's his point of saying that is? You say you love God. He addresses this in, his, in this letter. Oh, I love God. Oh, how I love Jesus. You ever seen God? No. He said you love God. No one's ever seen God. If we love one another, God is abiding in us. You, what he's, the point he's making is here, anybody can say, I love God. James says it this way, you say you believe. The demons believe and tremble. John is saying it this way. No one's ever seen God. If we love one another, God is abiding. There's the force of the verb against the present active. God is abiding in us. What's his point? That one anothering is evidence that there is the abiding reality, that God is not just some figure we know about, some being we acknowledge, we give assent to. God is, as we sang, this is our God. And he is dwelling in us by his Holy Spirit. God is abiding in us. And his agape love is being perfected in us. Now, we will never be perfect. That is absolutely righteous without any stain of sin this side of heaven. Praise God, one day in glory we will be. But not this side of heaven. 
So the idea of being perfected is you, you, could, you could use the term mature. It's being completed. It's growing in us. It's almost John's equivalent of saying like James, you say you have faith. Show me your faith. No one's ever seen God. If we are loving one another, though, God is abiding in us. You see, at some point, a person who finds it very difficult, I'm just continually, habitually difficult to love other people, needs to ask himself or herself the honest question, does God truly abide in me? John is saying matter-of-factly here, if we are loving one another, God is abiding in us. And the fact that we are one anothering, it may be stumblingly, it may be failingly, it may be falteringly, it may be uncomfortable, but, but, the, but it's, it's a desire, it's a want to, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, an attempt to. If that's there, if you can honestly say today, Brother Bill, I don't, I don't know what to do, how to, I don't know how to help people, but I, God knows my heart, I want to. I want to bless other people. Rejoice. Because you didn't put that in there yourself. That's evidence that God is abiding in you. And then you just give yourself to it. One of the devil's lies, and you're going to, you're going to face this as we go through these different one another descriptions in the, in, the, in the New Testament. Is that you're not qualified. You don't know enough. You're not smart enough. You're not healthy enough. You're not sincere enough. He will bombard you with every... What does he do? He comes to steal, kill, destroy. Let me tell you something. The devil gets out of his hammock when a people of God say, God being our helper and giving us power to live, we will one another one another. We will give ourselves to that. When I encounter something in the Scriptures, it says, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. We're going to look at that passage in Ephesians. I'm going to do that. Provoke one another to love and good works. We're going to look at one point uh, in our study in Hebrews about how your attendance in gathered times is a way to provoke one another to love and good works. The love of God is the prime motivator. Not guilt, not perceived need. The love of God so I'm going to close this morning asking you this. Is the love of God abiding and flourishing in you? Now, for some, it's not. You don't need to feel badly and say, oh, my, you made me feel bad, Pastor. No. Because you see, if you call upon the Lord Jesus Christ, the one whom God so gave because he so loved the world, call upon Jesus Christ, repenting of your sin and, and committing your life to him by faith, he will implant his love in you as a part of the new birth. For some of you, it may be, well, you know, Pastor, I've known, I've known a time in my life when, when there was more zeal for God than I, than I know now. Well, again, don't let the devil beat you up about that. The shortest path back to that time is to repent of lukewarmness and say, Lord, I come anew and afresh to you while you give me breath I want to love you and show your love to others by in this engaging of one anothering because I know that that's how you sent Jesus to love me. I was the one another Jesus loved when he died on the cross for me and rose from the grave. I want to be that. I want to be one another to others. And he will give you that. He will give you that. And then some say, Put me in the game, coach. Put me in the game. I want to get after this. And to you, I'm going to say sick them like a hound dog. 
Unleash the church. Don't let the devil bind you up. You are, you are unleashed to love one another. You are loosed to love one another. You don't need permission because you've already been commanded. Love one another. And pray. Pray for yourself. Dear God, help my life to overflow in a one anothering mentality and posture. And dear God, work this into my brothers and my sisters in Christ. And use this challenge to touch the hearts of those who have who've been content for whatever reason to simply dabble in religion and have never really come to faith in Christ. God loves sinners like you and me. And he showed his love in sending Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ loved so much that he laid down his life for us. And he says, if I lay down my life, how much more should you? How much more should you? If I, your master, your Lord, serve you by washing your feet, how much more should you one to another? Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We bow before you in Jesus' name. We thank you so much for the passages of Scripture. Lord, you've scattered them throughout the New Testament, so it, it'd be easy for us to read through the New Testament and not sense the concentration of them, the, the intensity of them, the comprehensiveness of them, the thundering call that they constitute when brought together to challenge us to think beyond ourselves and to think of others, to express your love for us in our commitment to one another, each other. And so I pray that during this study, there will come to individuals a kindling of this commitment. I pray that to this congregation, there will come a revival, an awakening, a flood tide, that people will be engaged for no other reason and to glorify you and to enjoy you and to obey the commandments of Jesus Christ, be engaged in outdoing one another in service and in love, in blessing and in caring. Come, wind of God, breathe upon us in this place. Give feet and energy to our thoughts and our desires. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing.